started, because uh, I'm sure people will struggle in through the through the morning. Uh, welcome back. I hope there's not too many sore heads from last night, and I congratulate you on making it here to both breakfast and the and the debate on time on a Sunday morning, a beautiful Sunday morning in my hometown of Brisbane. Uh, We've got a debate this morning on workforce, and I'm sure we'll all agree that workforce is an extremely important issue for the AMA and for um, all governments, really, not just the, the Commonwealth Government. Um, and we've chosen a topic this morning uh, that will hopefully be uh, quite provocative um, and uh, instill uh, in you mixed feelings, because uh, what I think our debaters have found is that as they've gone along, they've actually, whether it's groupthink or not, um, convinced themselves either way at different points in their discussions. And so hopefully uh, you'll agree that there definitely is um, some nuance to this, um, uh, to this topic. Just a, just a little bit about, uh, have we got the topic to actually pop up, please? And what we're going to do, so, so there's the topic that our affirmative and negative teams, which I'll introduce in a second, um, are going to be talking about. But I'd like you to please, uh, and this will be a secret poll to begin with, um, and we'll, we'll open it uh, now. And using that Menti code, if you can just type that into your phone, and what I want you to say, whether you agree or disagree, um, with that statement as it currently stands. And I'll let you know, that, and we're gonna hide the results of that poll, and then we'll get you to do it again after the debate, and we'll have a look and see if um, our, our debaters have managed to change the minds um, of any of you in the, in the audience. Just to a little bit of uh, context, uh, the newly or re-elected uh, Commonwealth Government is in the throes of uh, developing a national workforce strategy and the AMA has been asking for that and so this issue uh, is very, very topical from that point of view. You'll be aware that we have excuse me, about 115,000 doctors in this, in this country as at the end of last year and of course that number is increasing quite uh, uh, quite significantly. We've got medical schools that are yet to uh, have their graduating classes come online, and that's despite graduating 3,800 students um, in, uh, in in recent times. We all know that the maldistribution is a problem, and market forces have not been uh, necessarily helpful. Uh, general practice is undersubscribed, and so clearly there's a problem there for two years running, uh, despite this high workforce uh, that, I, that I just alluded to. So there's lots of challenges. Three speakers on each side, as you can see. Let me just introduce them um, to you. Uh, on the affirmative team, uh, going through them in order, the first speaker is Associate Professor Susan Newhouse. She's a senior surgeon, recent surgical representative on Federal Council and distinguished ex-army officer, consultant surgeon in, public, in private surgical practice with an academic appointment uh, as well. Um, she's appointed to the RACS Court of Examiners. Uh, Associate Professor Newhouse contributes at the highest level in her profession as a clini clinician, academic and researcher with subspecialty expertise in the management of melanoma and sarc sarcoma. Um, and delegates will recall that Associate Professor Newhouse was admitted to the role of fellows of the AMA yesterday. Uh, affirmative number two, uh, Ms Jacoba Van Wees, who is the 2019 Chair of the Australian Medical Students Association Rural Health Committee, the peak representative body for rural background students, rural clinical school students and the rural health interests of medical students. AMSA Rural Health supports and facilitates medical student engagement with rural health and advocates on their behalf. Um, and uh, Ms Van Wees is currently uh, in a graduate entry program with Monash University, having previously graduated um, from a Bachelor of Biomedical Science. She's passionate about all aspects of rural health and rural medicine, with a personal interest in non-GP vocational training in rural areas. Third speaker for the affirmative, Associate Professor Saxon Smith, <coughs> excuse me, who's a dermatologist known to uh, most people in this room who actually initially trained in New Zealand. He's got a master's degree in health law with a PhD, together with numerous uh, peer-reviewed publications. He's a principal dermatologist um, in uh, private practice and also a staff specialist at Royal North Shore Hospital and clinical associate professor at the University of Sydney. He's got extensive experience in supervision and training and his range of research interests outside dermatology include workforce planning and ethics. He's a past president of AMA New South Wales, a current member of Federal Council representing New South Wales and the ACT. 
turning to the negative team now, the first speaker for the negative is Dr. Chris Wilson. Uh, Chris is co-deputy chair of the Council of Doctors in Training and PGY8 General Medicine and Geriatrics Advanced Trainee in Perth, who's got extensive experience in physician training development. Outside of clinical roles, Chris has worked in tertiary hospital education and as a leadership advisor for Western Australian Institute for Health Leadership and as an education registrar and project officer with West Australian Country Health Services. He has an interest in the complexities and challenges associated with workforce planning, all of which are going to stand him in good stead to be able to ar argue as the first negative. The, the second negative uh, speaker, Dr Innes Rio, is a senior general practitioner working in urban practice in Melbourne. She's on the executive of the AMA Council of General Practice and the AMA uh, Victoria section of general practice and chair of North Western Melbourne uh, PHN. She's got extensive experience in many facets of health care. These include governance, strategic planning, thought leadership, education, development and management, clinical leadership and many others. She's committed to quality, effective, efficient and integrated health care uh, with the central importance of general practice obviously high on her agenda. And, and finally, uh, third uh, speaker in the negative and the third speaker overall this morning is Dr Roderick McKay who's a salaried intensivist and anaesthetist. He's vice president currently of AMA Victoria and chair of the AMA Federal Council of Public Hospital Doctors and the Federal Assistant Secretary Treasurer of the Australian Salaried Medicals Officer. Uh, Medical Officers Federation. He's a bioethicist, lawyer and company director. He specialises in critical care and end of life issues. His legal specialty is administrative law, contributing to Rob's uh, infamous penchant for pedantry, which will almost certainly stand him in good stead for <laughs> this morning's debate. Uh, I've, I've done it that way so that we can crack on when the, the speakers um, are introduced. And so I'd really like you to welcome, please. Oh, I should just say uh, the speakers uh, get six minutes um, for uh, their remarks and, um, and there will be a rebuttal. We'll go alternating, starting with uh, Associate Professor Newhouse as the first affirmative. And then, as I said, at the end of the debate, we'll do a repeat poll. Please welcome Associate Professor Newhouse. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Our team will convince you that the Australian model of medical school and vocational training has well passed its use-by date. It is no longer fit for purpose and it needs to change. To quote former AMA president, Dr. Michael Gannon, 15 years ago, the problem was that we did not have enough doctors. Today, we're now graduating record numbers of medical students, but do not have enough postgraduate training places in areas and specialties where they are most needed. We have had an explosion of medical schools and graduates in the last few decades, and yet our training pipelines remain steeped in a post-colonial model that is not fit for our rapidly changing world. Make no mistake, our world is changing, and our healthcare workforce, not just in the future, but right now, must adapt and innovate. If we want to remain relevant, if we want to provide quality care to our patients, if we want to keep our community well, we must fundamentally change our medical school and vocational training model. To ensure a fit for purpose workforce, we need medical graduates with the capabilities and the desire to provide the right care in the right time at the right place. Ready for the future which is at our doorstep, not for the past. Our medical students, our doctors in training here with us today, should expect that before they have even obtained their fellowships, the practice of medicine will have fundamentally changed. Yesterday, we heard about the opportunities that artificial intelligence and augmented technologies offer. This may have seemed futuristic, but they are here. They are real, and they will fundamentally change the skills, training, and workforce needs over the next five to 10 years. A decade is a long time for a medical student or a trainee, and it should not be wasted. Doctors can spend years in resident level positions or unaccredited jobs, and yet many of the roles that we're training them for simply will not exist by the time they've made it through to the end of that pipeline. Patterns of disease are also changing dramatically. In my own career, operations that were bread and butter when I was a surgical registrar, such as dealing with perforated ulcers, are no longer or rarely performed. 
I know that my work as a melanoma surgeon means that I will become redundant in probably less than five years. Melanoma diagnosis by visual scanner and predictive algorithms are here already. There will soon no longer be a need for Saxon as a dermatologist or me as a surgeon to perform wide excision or sentinel node biopsy. Instead, a laser technician will ablate the primary tumour, a pathologist will recommend a checkpoint inhibitor, and neither surgeon nor dermatologist will be part of the treating algorithm. In only a few years, cancer follow-up patients will simply have their scans reported by algorithms, tumour marker levels reported directly into their electronic healthcare record, and neither the surgeon nor the radiologist will be required. In 2019, the rising diseases are obesity and mental health disorders. There has been an explosion of reproductive technology institutions and biobanks. Clinicians of the future will need to specialise in areas that are not even on our curriculums and for which we have no training pathways. Our workforce needs clinicians trained in nanotechnology, genomics, proteomics. It needs mental health care workers, dietitians, and lifestyle coaches. We will need a generation of medical practitioners who are comfortable designing apps, are experts in health analytics, in coding, in the use of decision-making algorithms. As Australia's life expectancy increases, there will be an increased demand on primary health care physicians. But in reality, most of that burden will be met not by doctors, but by aged care workers. We do not need more doctors, but we do need almost a million more aged care workers. GPs will continue to take on the role of the concierge in an increasingly complex healthcare system. But as healthcare is increasingly delivered in people's homes, the relationship between a patient and their doctor will require a whole new suite of skills. In some centres in the US, already 50% of consultations are done by phone, by email or by video. Medicines will be delivered remotely. Simple procedural tasks we consider routine today, such as vaccinations, will no longer require a trip to the general practice. Vocational trainees need to develop new and relevant skills during their training, not be locked into historical, rigid and rules-based stovepipes. We need increased porosity between the silos of the profession and with other areas of the healthcare system, agnostic as to how those skills were obtained or how long was spent in a training pipeline. Australia already has an oversupply of doctors. We graduate a record number of doctors and we cannot allow this to continue. We simply cannot afford it. More doctors means increased competition. But competition in the healthcare sector rarely drives down prices or delivers value. Competition drives doctors into private practice and pushes up out of pocket costs. It exposes the public to increasing numbers of relatively junior clinicians entering private, unsupervised practice because they cannot get a supervised hospital appointment. It creates more disparity and larger gender pay gaps as those who can work longer hours benefit more. If Australia is to have a fit-for-purpose medical workforce in 2025, we need to understand that the future lies not in graduating more doctors. The future of our healthcare system, the future of our country, will be determined by how we can adapt now to the rapidly changing environment. To build the national workforce we need for success, we can no longer be complacent. It is time for a rethink. It is time to fundamentally redesign our model of medical school and vocational training so that it is fit for the future, not fit for the past. Thank you. So the first salvo, Australia has an oversupply of doctors and the current model, model of medical school and vocational training is no longer fit for purpose in this context. The first negative speaker, please, Dr Chris Wilson. Thank you. So on behalf of Team Negative, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance in the morning after the gala dinner, especially the doctors in training in the room. Our protectionist friends on the affirmative will tell you that we're in a state of critical student and workforce oversupply. They'll tell you postgraduate training is broken. I ask you, though, 
Where is the evidence for wholesale change? Where is the evidence that our model of training is at fault? We will articulate why we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to medical training. We believe our training model requires evolution, not revolution. There's two main points that we would like you to consider. One, as a profession, we are maldistributed rather than in a state of oversupply. And two, medical training as we know it is not fundamentally broken. To give the affirmative a helping hand, here's our plan of attack. I'll talk about our world leading training model and how it is still fit for purpose. Innes will change your view on doctor numbers and the simplistic view that our profession is in oversupply, especially when applied to the looming workforce crisis that exists in general practice. Roderick will highlight where the true challenges is, and here's a spoiler, it's not with training. Susan talked about the rapid change in medicine that we're currently experiencing. However, I would argue that change is a constant in medicine. Methods of investigation, treatment, models of care, they've always been changing, always been evolving. I know when I went to medical school, and it's not all that long ago, hepatitis C was incurable. Monoclonal antibodies were a side note in a single lecture that we put in the too hard basket. Clot retrieval, not even a thing. I'm sure when we all think about something in our routine practice today, uh, there's things that did not exist when we were at university. Some of us will remember the time that ultrasound was developed. Some of us might even remember penicillin. But with all the advancements, has the model of university and apprenticeship style vocational training changed significantly? I think if we reflect back on our own time, we can say probably not. Yes, the content has evolved. The style of teaching has evolved, and we'd argue for the better. But the overall model hasn't changed. It continues to serve us well. At university, we already prepare our graduates for skills beyond anatomy, physiology, and pathology. We skill them in the personal and professional development, how to see people as a whole. We give them a broad exposure to the scientific basis of holistic medicine. We give them a platform on which to build a life in a profession that is vast, varied, unpredictable in its course, and encompasses roles beyond the bedside, more so now than ever. That is no mean feat and should not be discounted. But what about the tsunami of medical students, you'll say? I'm sure some of our speakers on the other side will. Our population is ageing. Medicine is getting more complex. If we hadn't made those moves 15 years ago, today we'd be standing here arguing that the profession is in critical undersupply. And that argument would be irrefutable. So yes, the numbers have increased, but that's because they had to. However, we still haven't seen, at this point, any Commonwealth-supported students miss out on internships. I'd also like to mention that from the rural clinical schools, we know that doctors who train in the bush are more likely to return. This goes to highlight the current maldistribution of our training places, much like our downstream workforce. In 2015, the Wilson Fayer Internship Review was tasked with assessing the current model of internship and whether it remained fit for purpose. At the time, this, this association submitted that while there was room for improvement, the model was not broken. Thankfully, the, reviews of the, uh, the recommendations of that review supported our views. The two main outcomes were that there was an opportunity to expand internship to include exposure to more of the patient journey, and from that we read primary care, and a suggested move towards a two-year pr protected internship with general registration after year one. And this is a proposal that COAG has recently agreed to. Already, we have programs around the country that offer access to primary care and in internship. What Wilson and Fayer proposed was an evolution of our current system. Likewise, the two-year internship simply ensures that the accreditation standards currently applied to interns and most PGY2s around the country will now be standardised. None of this strikes me as no longer fit for purpose. This is evolution, not revolution. Our college vocational training system is the envy of the world, as are our fellows. Yet we've heard this weekend that general practice training positions have gone unfilled for two years. Psychiatry in a similar position. How can we be in oversupply if there is vocational training positions going begging? Again, we have evidence of maldistribution. If we look specifically at general practice, 
The fix is not a revolution, but rather an improvement of workplace conditions, as again we have heard this weekend, and better workforce data to enable trainees to make informed career decisions. Innes will touch on this more, but concerningly, a review of GP workforce supply and training completed in WA last year found that to cover a retiring GP working a standard working week, we now need to be training 2.1 new GP fellows. And dare I say it, we might even be looking at an imminent undersupply of general practitioners. So in summary, yes, there's a lot of work that we can do to get smarter about how and where we train our workforce. But this isn't oversupply, nor is the model broken. What we need in medical training is continual evolution, not revolution. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Let's go straight into the second speaker for the affirmative team, Ms. Jacoba Van Wees. Please welcome her. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so a few points to address there from the negative, um, but firstly, I'd just like to say, as the affirmative, first affirmative speaker rightly pointed out, there is a distinct lack of flexibility within our current vocational training model. For many training programs, and I'm sure our doctors in training can attest to this, there is only one entry point, one exit point, and no ability to gain greater exposure to other areas, no opportunity to gain a greater breadth of skills, that will support them in their future as a doctor. More so, we've seen this increasing shift to an MD model of medical school with a postgraduate course in line with our international equivalents. This means that the average age of our interns and our junior doctors is increasing, and many of our interns and junior doctors have external responsibilities beyond their medical careers, such as spouses, children, houses, mortgages, there needs to be an ability for these people to train part-time, to not be expected to sacrifice their families, their mental well-being, and sacrifice their own lives, as we've touched on throughout this weekend, in order to complete these rigid training programs. We know that well-rounded, healthy individuals make for better doctors and then can provide better care for their patients. For our millennial generation of junior doctors, Work-life balance is a priority that is non-negotiable, and we are increasingly placing value on working in a supported team environment rather than as the stereotypical super doc who worked unsafe hours with a one in two on call and relied on a single income household. This is not the society we're living in, and our training model doesn't recognize that. This model is not feasible for the future of medicine and the training of pathways need to adapt and modernise. In regards to the oversupply of medical students, as a medical student myself, I can speak from my own perspective about the increasing number of graduates. Contrary to what the negative said, the evidence is irrefutable. During the period of 2008 to 2012, the number of registered medical practitioners increased by nearly 17% compared to a population increase of only 7%. Australia does have one of the highest rates of medical pra practitioners per capita worldwide, and this oversupply is funneling down to the most junior level, with the number of medical graduates having approximately doubled to up to 3,800 this year. As my opposition pointed out, they are correct in that at the moment, no domestic student has missed out on an internship place, but this is inevitable. The shortage of domestic internship places is looming closer every day, and unless we do something about it, it will be here tomorrow. Furthermore, increased numbers did not increase rural doctors. I would argue that male distribution does not equal oversupply, but it does not equal undersupply. Male distribution is a separate issue to our oversupply of graduates and needs to be addressed through our systemic issues. The clear vocational bottleneck is resulting from this oversupply. And as we've pointed out, many junior doctors are unable to gain accredited training positions in their fields of choice. The negative might try to argue that indeed, those training positions, positions are going unfilled, but this is not the result of not enough graduates. It is a systemic issue and it is multifactorial. It doesn't relate to supply and demand, but instead is the amalgamated effect of poor public perception, professional attitudes, wrongful devaluement, financial reimbursement, 
and poor medical school experiences. Again, in that same four year period, there was a 67% increase in non-GP special specialists, but only a 33% increase in general practitioners, suggesting it's not the quantity of doctors, but the differentiation of doctors along their career progression that is creating this maldistribution and these disparities that our communities are experiencing. This is further demonstrated by the fact that we are predicting a specialty training shortfall of 1,000 places by 2030. We've been trying to address maldistribution for years with the same old tactics, and a revitalised medical school and training model could help address these issues through selecting for desired qualities from as early as medical school entrance to ensure that we have a greater uptake of rural practice and a right, wider breadth of specialists being produced. This is not a workforce, there is not a workforce or community need for the niche subspecialised practitioners in the metropolitan and tertiary centres. Yet we select for students and junior doctors who display interest in taking this route rather than selecting for what Australia needs. Early streaming and fast track specialisation is not the answer and it doesn't produce well-rounded doctors or adaptable doctors. However, our new model needs to select for students who not only perform well academically, but also have character traits that make them well suited to the workforce. Traits like resilience, adaptability, communication, approachability, technology skills, and so many others that will help them to meet the needs of Australia's communities. If we don't enact change now, in 10 years time, there will be a plethora of subspecialists without any career options and a number of communities, predominantly in our rural locations, without any high quality generalists. Furthermore, not only are the health needs of Australia changing, but they, the diversity of Australia is changing. If you've only ever trained and worked in a metropolitan tertiary centre in our current, current pathways, with only the interest in working in a subspecialty, you are not equipped with the skills or the breadth of knowledge that is required to care for the needs of Australia's increasingly diverse and rurally located community. Our current specialty training programs incorporate the bare minimum of education experiences relating to providing culturally safe care. This includes working with interpreters and how to acknowledge the significant trauma and adversity that many of our patients have experienced. On the same note, it would be remiss not to acknowledge the disservice that our current training models do to address the health inequity experienced by Indigenous Australians. Our training system needs to train us to be ready to work with these people and meet the needs of our patient rather than enjoying them ignoring the majority and telling us that patient-centred care is the way to practice. If you want your doctors to be able to provide holistic care to all demographics, you need to provide them with the training to do this. Training by interaction may work, but if done poorly, it is the patient who suffers. Clearly, our training model is riddled with multifactorial issues and needs to be completely reinvented. This is a systemic problem, and what we need to remember amidst all of this debate is that it's the patients who are suffering, and that's not okay. Thank you. Anyone changed their mind yet? <laughs> Remember, at the end of the debate, we're going to ask you to vote again on whether you agree or disagree with the statement that we're debating here, that Australia has an oversupply of doctors and the current model of medical school and vocational training is no longer fit for purpose in this context. Would you please welcome the second speaker for the negative, Dr Innes Rio. Thank you and thank you teams. Um, just in response to some of the issues that were actually raised there, we actually have a fantastic training system because you can see it in the outcomes. We've actually got a really, we've adapted, you know, as practitioners across the spectrum, we've adapted to changing environment because of the skills that we've actually developed in medical student, uh, in medical school and beyond. We've learned to think, we've learned to analyse, we've learned to communicate, we've learned to do research, and all of those things have put us in massive stead to actually uh, deal with changing environments. I'm a GP and I can and have practised in a number of fields over time and that's due to the, un that's due to the training that I've, I've obtained. And that's actually reflected in the fact that we actually have amazing outcomes. Um, the issues that, that Jacopo was talking about are there, but they're systems issues. They are not issues about oversupply and they're not issues about training. 
our medical school and voc vocational training work. The outcomes of our healthcare system is fantastic. We have one of the highest life expectancies in the world, 85 for women, 81 for men, and that's increased for about over. Uh, of, that's increased by 10 years from the mid-60s. As Greg Hunt told us the other day, the New York Commonwealth Fund looked at the 11 highest healthcare models in the world in 2017, and we came top of the track for clinical outcomes. That's due to the training that we have both as um, undergraduates and postgraduates. It only came second overall due to issues of access and equity, and that speaks to the fact that we don't have an oversupply. In fact, we have an undersupply. So just keep that in mind, because at the end of the day, that's what we want to achieve. We want to achieve health outcomes for our community. And if we're well trained to be able to do that, well, that's demonstrated by the outcomes. The other issue is that Australians love their healthcare system. Think of the whole Medi-Scare campaign, you know, at the last election. The patient experience survey by the Australian Bureau, Bureau of Statistics in 2017 found extremely high satisfaction rates by people across the spectrum, which again speaks to the issue about how patients relate to us, across medical practitioner workforces. But what it also found was that one in four people waited too long for an appointment. Again, this is not about what we provide. These are issues of access. Um, and the other part of the question is actually about oversupply. Yes, the number of doctors are going up. The number of medical, uh, medical students have gone up. But that's because we need it to, not because there's an oversupply. It's both about the need of the population and also about the way we work. There's more population. In 1960, we had 15 million Australians. Now we have over 25 million Australians. And the things that we do are much more complex, chronic, and there's just more stuff to do. We've got an ageing population, complex and chronic issues related to lifestyle, more complex systems that we have to actually negotiate um, and coordinate, and more patient and consumer expectation. Every week it seems to me, and it feels like me, to me, that we have more effective evidence-based interventions. Because I'm well trained, I can adapt to that. When I was a cardiology resident some 20 years ago, I remember my, um, my consultant at the time saying, gee, you guys have got to work with streptokinase now, it's so hard. When people used to have a heart attack, we used to give them a really nice view, a glass of whiskey, and they'd sit there for a month. And if you fast forward to now and think about all of the interventions and all the things that we need to do, the whole concept of grandma, or in my, fa my case, nonna, having a heart attack, oh, sorry, having a stroke, has actually got a completely to new meaning to what it did 10 years ago. And as I was considering what Greg Hunt was thinking about the other day, he was reeling off all of these new medications from the PBS for cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy and melanoma, I thought to myself, now how am I going to get that into my head and how am I going to incorporate that into my practice? And I will, and I'll do it very effectively, as will everybody here that needs to do it, because we are well trained, but it will take more time. And we work differently to what we used to work. Um, as evidenced by the updated Geneva Statement, we realise that to provide good care, we need to look after ourselves well, and it's very much what you said before. We don't want to work 20, 80 hours a week anymore, unsupported, few holidays, long and unsafe working conditions. We don't want to come back two weeks after we've had a baby. And we want to continue to learn. We want CPD, we want sabbatical. And all of that comes out in actually how we work differently now. The WA workforce data that um, Chris was talking about showed that in 2000, we needed uh, the full-time service equivalent of one general practitioner meant it was 0.58. So one general practitioner worked 3.5 days per week. In the space of five years, from 2000 to 2015, that went down to 2.5. So one full-time general practitioner worked 2.5 days a week face-to-face. -face. So you need 2.1 trained GPs for the full-time service equivalent. So we have responded to the issues of changing IR, and very appropriately. 
In hospital IR um, um, contracts, it's about 20% of non-face-to-face. -face. And certainly in my work as a GP, I would spend 20 to 30% of my clinical time in non-face-to-face -face issues, writing reports, reviewing what I should provide patients, checking results, coordinating care. I'm sure it's the same experience around the place. And as we have more doctors, older doctors that are leaving, we actually need more of a workforce to take that up. Plus, we don't just want doctors doing face-to-face -face work. If you look around and think about the skills that you've obtained and the people that you know, we want doctors in places that aren't just about direct clinical care. We want them as CEOs of hospitals. We want them as executives of hospitals. We want them in health departments. We want them in policy and research, and we want them driving politics. So those skill sets that we learned and they, those experiences that we have actually are so translate, translatable and should be actually changed the rest of the environment. There is no oversupply. We continue to import international medical graduates. In 2011-12, that was over 3,500 graduates, and last year it was 2,100. So that compares to 3,569 medical graduates, but we still have to import over 2,000 international medical graduates. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare showed that 33% of our doctors received their initial qualifications overseas, 41% of medical practitioners employed in rural and regional areas actually got their um, qualifications overseas. So we need more local medical students, and we don't need to nick them perhaps from overseas countries quite as much that have invested in them and need them as well which leads me to the issue of rural, remote and Indigenous health. Who in this room would not say that there's an undersupply in those areas? So, as you've heard today, um, we don't need to actually change the undergraduate um, training model, but we need to address the issues of access. And if we don't address these issues of access, we will have increasing workforce substitution. We've heard, heard over the last two days the, um, the creep, or the jump, I would say, of pharmacists into our um, workforce, into our, into, the work, into our scope of work. And certainly pharmacists, midwives, nurses, psychologists, physiotherapists, and even sort of osteopaths and chiropractors actually want to help us all because our patients actually aren't accessing us sufficiently. So yes, we have some problems, but they are not problems of um, training and they are not problems of um, oversupply. We need an evolution and not a revolution. Thank you. Innes, I'd have been almost disappointed if we didn't drag the pharmacist into the debate as well, so thank you for that. We, there will be time for discussion at the end um, after all the speakers have have uh, have spoken and we've given our verdict on the on the debate. So prepare your thoughts and comments. Uh, but to wrap up the uh, affirmative team case, uh, could you please welcome to the microphone uh, Associate Professor Saxon Smith? Friends, colleagues those out in the Twitter sphere. Let's come back to reality. Let's put aside the nostalgia, this past of beautiful, perfect rose-tinted glasses that our opposition are so desperately trying to paint for you. Let's come back to the reality of today, but more importantly, the future. The future for the profession, the future for health, and the future for our country. All too sadly, we are putting our egos in play where we think that we need two people to replace us as an individual. Are we that self-important as key person dependence that we think that we can just go, well, two people for me, that will be about right. The reality is it's not about us as individuals. It's not about us with our egos. It's about how we can do things better. We know that there's technology out there uh, which will actually mean that you can treat 17 to 15 patients in the first two hours of your um, day to day via connecting through our internet, via apps, etc. We know there's a colleague in the room, sadly he's actually not in the room, and he will be taken up with that later. But it, there's an app which, through his general practice, is able to monitor through the, uh, the Bluetooth technology of the weight scales, the blood pressure monitor in the patient's home that feeds directly into their iPhone 
which then connects to their health record and his practice to watch. Are they getting fluid edema? Do we need to pull up their furosemide? And you can stream that in a better and more consistent way. And that's monitored not only by the doctor, but the whole healthcare team in his healthcare hub. They can also liaise with uh, this technology. Please Google it. It's called Pillow, P-I-L-L-O. Somewhat scary, little funny looking machine with this little face that's almost humanoid, but not quite. But essentially it's your health home hub. It will distribute and dispense your medications. It automatically inter inter you know, connects to the internet to provide that health information and more importantly to your loved ones when you miss your medications and to your doctor. They don't have to come to us. They don't have to line up and wait in a waiting room. They don't have to get the flu before they get the flu back because they're waiting in that waiting room. Instead, they can have most of this technology done from home. We're able to intersect with them. We're able to provide that concierge sort of service that my first speaker was uh, clearly enunciating. Now, sadly, the first speaker for the negative is showing a clear indoctrinated think or group think that comes from recent university graduation. Now, universities are training institutions. By institutions, I mean big buildings, very slow to move, very hard to negotiate with. And we all know that as soon as you have that new textbook that you have to buy each year, that was outdated five years ago. I know that because I've just written a new chapter and sadly, I have to write it again. But these things happen because technology is evolving to such a pace that the old style doesn't work anymore. We know that if you go to the universities, you know, we've moved from those days of dissection, we spend room in the dissection lab, which wasn't one of the more enjoyable experiences through my training, but I did it. We moved to prosection because it was just easier to have more students around a smaller kind of thing to, sh to show them as opposed to interacting with them. And now increasingly it's even hard to get access to that prosections. So they have to completely relearn their anatomy before they sit their surgical exams or before they fit, sit their physician exams or all their emergency medicine exams. They're not getting the training that they used to have. And that's not a rose-tinted sort of view. It's a practical reality. There are more people. There are more students contending for that clinical exposure. And we know that gaggle, that, that classic sort of stream as you walk down, you know, whether it's in house or if you're older like me in ER, you know, those are the days. Um, or even, you know, perhaps going back further. Or if you're in New Zealand or Shortland Street, but that's a rubbish show, but that's okay. The reality was you'd had the eminent consultant, followed by a senior registrar, perhaps a junior registrar, a resident, an intern, and maybe one student. We now have that same sort of system, but instead of one student, you have eight. You have more universities, more graduates, contending for more clinical exposure, which just doesn't exist in our institutions, because the model doesn't fit. It's not fit for purpose. Not fit to make these people the people that they need to be, train them up to what they need to be. And the more you graduate, the less they're going to be actually exposed. The hierarchy doesn't work. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, they're talking about a two-year internship. Two years in internship because you're not getting the same clinical exposure. You're not getting that same opportunity to meet that bare minimum of competency to move up that next rung. So rather than making it two years, because that's the only thing you can do, why don't we get different and get more proactive in the way we get our exposure. But institutions like universities and our big teaching hospitals are unable to do that. Big, large buildings, lots of bureaucracy, they move very slowly. We think the Titanic was a slow-moving ship that's ran into an iceberg. Sadly, I think our universities and our training institutions are hitting that same iceberg when it comes to our training. We're not getting that competency and that exposure that our people sorely need. And unfortunately, this flows on through the years, and we now know you might go, well, there's not enough senior doctors around there. There's not enough senior doctors like Susan to do melanoma surgery and sarcoma surgery. There's more than enough in these two, so I won't worry about uh, Rod over there. But we, we know that ultimately that's not necessarily true. This, it probably goes a long way to explain why just in this last election we had preeminent former AMA presidents of uh, Professor Brian Auer and Professor Karen Phelps fleeing the clinical ship, fleeing that clinical ship to politics. They've seen the writing on the wall. They're smart people. And not only that, we have our most immediate past president with uh, Ma Dr. Michael Gannon in the room where, sadly, short of a dollar and short of food for breakfast, he gets up this early in the morning to get the free, the free breakfast and he was out of the room for a little while. Do you know why he was out of this room? Ladies and gentlemen, he was out of this room. He was valet parking. Needing to find that money. And that goes to this concept of what the business of medicine is and it's changed. 
the more people you put out there, the more people that are graduating, the more they're contending for that smaller pot of money. And it's not all about money, but it's about if you run a business. And we know that 48% of all the doctors in the room here are small business owners. 92% GPs are in small businesses. About 40% of specialists or other specialists are in businesses, small businesses. If there's fewer people to contend with, you create opportunities. You might do more knee arthroscopies, which we know through the Quality and Safety Commission that it's not necessarily providing the benefit that it needs. You might suddenly call yourself a wellness doctor. Imagine that, orthopedic surgeon and wellness doctor. Emergency physician and... It doesn't quite work. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> but the reality is we are creating business for ourselves. We are creating that niche into the worried world. This is above and beyond the concept of you know, the determinants of health. This is not about contending with obesity. It's not about trying to get the diabetes rates down. It's about finding another way to put food on the table. It's not about health, but it is taking money from the healthcare purse. And ultimately, when we look at maldistribution, maldistribution, as we say, is not a question of oversupply or undersupply. It's about people not being in the right place. We know there is a maldistribution, and that directly impacts on healthcare outcomes as you move out of those metropolitan centres. The difficulty is, how do we convince our colleagues to move outside when we vote somewhat with our egos, we vote somewhat with our families, we vote somewhat with opportunities, and we vote somewhat to stay predominantly metropolitan because of all those factors. There are brave people amongst us who might take that footstep further and go out and work in Alice Springs in the emergency department. They might take those brave steps and drive up the freeway from Sydney to uh, Gosford, which is an hour, hour five drive each day as a dermatologist. Um, that's a long step for a dermatologist, you know. But it's servicing a community of more than 400,000 with only three dermatologists to service that population. It's very clear population is becoming more metrocentric, which will lead ultimately to poorer and poorer health outcomes in the bush, unless, ladies and gentlemen, unless we get smart about this, unless we look to the future, we know when we hear that call over the airplane, is there a doctor on the plane? It won't be about the doctor. It will be about, is there a biomechanical surgeon on the plane? Is there a neurofibro physician on the plane? Is there a pharmacogeneticist on the plane? Are we going to be smart? Are we going to use our workforce properly? Are we going to achieve and maintain the best outcomes in the world by being better at it? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, weaving a spell and finalising the case for the affirmative, that was Saxon, but hopefully to do the same for the negative, could you please welcome Dr Rod McCray. Thank you to the adjudicating audience. The concierge nods hello to a patient entering hospital. Uh, an hour later, he sees the same patient sprinting out of that hospital. Uh, so he says, what's going on? Uh, he, he gets told. Uh, the nurse said, there, there, it's a simple operation. Nothing should go wrong. And the conscience says, yeah, but I'm sure that was just trying to be reassuring. And the patient says, yeah, yeah sure, that's fantastic. But the nurse was talking to the surgeon. Now, the affirmative would almost have you believe that Australian medical practitioners are demoralised, poorly trained, oversupplied and have no future. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. We're not doomed. To Dr Newhouse, we say the about decade training, which just about every university graduate does, irrespective of their faculty, and actually which looks nothing like medical training from even 10 years ago, is not wasted. We thank her very much for her wishful thinking and point out she admitted to mention the magic pill that's on its way, courtesy of the Star Trek movie where you can regrow a kidney. The question that we really want to hear answered by Dr Newhouse is what are the numbers on Saturday? We heard about artificial intelligence. Yesterday we heard some of the issues. The computer says yes. Autonomic bias, automation bias. The real risk is what are we analysing anyway? Is it based on the useful, relevant population compared to a medication trial in healthy 40-year-olds, but you actually give the pill to unhealthy, complex 
illness patients who are 80 years of age. Secondly, what's going on inside that black box? We've got the example that we heard yesterday, very concerning, about uh, the artificial intelligence analysing to read the word cancer on the chest film. Or what about the snow in there? It's a wolf. And yes, it's happening. It, we're modifying stuff. It's the nature of activity of clever people, which is what medical practitioners are, transforming but not eliminating the work of those necessary humans. Frankly, the real rub's going to be the cost. We, we know that. You've seen how people behave over a couple of hours of overtime. What on earth is, who on earth is going to make the decision and control which of the 250 absolutely mine is the best unit to do what and how will it talk to other things? So we understand that there are tweaks, there are things going on, but this is why we continuously do continuing medical education. To Ms Van Wees, thank you for the facts that you've spoken. Uh, have you spoken to a legal graduate or really graduates from any other faculty? They've got one entry, one exit, no jobs. Thank you for explaining why we need to further increase medical student numbers to prudently fill the gap as you and your peer group go to lunch. Yes, rural shortages do exist. <laughs> There's a system issue, but it's not a training issue. It's, it's changing. Bonding, the bonding program, analysed, researched, it's being tweaked. And that's exactly what we want to do. Dr Smith. Yes, it's the patient. I didn't hear the word, but it is about the patient. Haven't you, but haven't you heard of technology failing, not working? Privacy, hacking, false data, glitch, error. It'll be a well-trained doctor who's become familiar with that environment interpreting. And we're going to need more of them. So we have presented to you... Uh, oh, the health minister presented to us, in fact, that um, in his video, that Australia ranks number two for its global health system and number one for clinical outcomes on its $181 billion, 10.3% of GDP expenditure. Clearly, something is going right. It's not a bad place to start with the assumption that the health care we are delivering is the health care the community wants. We can't disagree with the fact that a 5.5% per year increase in medical graduates exists, but that just reflects the increasing entry into university of the population uh, who are themselves attending university. Dr Wilson showed how Australian medical schools produce the highest quality, in-demand medical graduates with a broad exposure to and an evidence-based scientific, holistic comprehension of physical and mental health producing practitioners, providing safe, independent, ethical practice. The, um, this means that the second limb of the question is just wrong. What we need is evolution, not revolution. Dr Rio carefully took you through, from a satellite view, how we do not have an oversupply of medical graduates, making the first limb of the, of the question wrong. What we need is evolution, not revolution. The retraining position vacancies. So, ipso facto, there cannot be an oversupply of doctors. We emerged from a critical doctor shortage in the 90s, never to be repeated. Dr Rio pointed out our doctors are changing, including their expectations from their work. So did Ms Van Wees. The Declaration of Geneva, as amended from time to time, doesn't state, I'm going to work non-stop. In Chicago, in October 2017, the amendment, as we recited on Friday, reads, I will attend to my own health, well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. There is a change and expansion to a growth mindset and resilience training versus the past, perhaps dangerous, fixed mindset concept of training. It's happening. Competition is good to bring out the best in people. By nature, there will be some disappointments. But in finance, not everybody can be the CEO of Macquarie Bank. Put simply, more medical practitioners are required to cover increasingly complex patients with increasing expectations. There is no oversupply. There is no silver bullet, whether it be the NBN, if it works, and for what? Artificial intelligence or the next big idea. Medical practice will be different, transforming incrementally, but led by doctors. It is evolution, not revolution. 
Our argument is that there is no oversupply of graduates, there is an undersupply of coordination of the fabulous currently available transforming training systems that exist at all stages of medical practice. There is maldistribution, but that is not equivalent to oversupply. To channel Bill Clinton, it's the bureaucracy, stupid. There's a disconnection on a national issue, but the Commonwealth government has, government has no power to force anyone to do something. 20% of legal graduates don't practice law. Is it so bad to permit spillage of medical graduates into areas beyond medical research and medical teaching? Isn't that an inherent good for the community? A state's charter is to provide service in public hospitals whose capacity has not matched population growth. Industrial instruments are now addressing issues of rostering, training time, bullying, a safe, inclusive workplace, aided by motions such as we had in our national conference 2018 minutes on page 52 of your agenda for learned colleges to ensure appropriate emphasis is on the, em in, on the importance of broad experience in a variety of clinical fields. That's what we're doing. It's an incremental change. It's that approach. Yes, there are issues, but it is not an oversupply of doctors or that medical school and vocational training is not fit for purpose. The question is to be rejected. There is transformation requiring doctors' input. It is evolution, not revolution. And of course, with respect to bureaucracy, there is awareness and movement through the Medical Workforce Reform Advisory Committee, and your own AMA is here to help. Thanks very much, Rod. All right. Get your phones out. Can we pop the, the, the poll open, please? Put the, put the code in if you haven't already. And I just want you to agree or disagree, please, with the topic of the debate, which you can see um, up there on the board. And if we can open that up. Is this, is this the first one or the current one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. If we can pop them up, please. Yeah. This, is, this is the current vote, is it? Yes, thanks, Phil. So this is the current vote. And then in a second, we'll put up the pre-debate vote. No, you can't abstain. Goodness. <laughs> OK, can, can we close that off then, please? And have we got the initial result? There you go. So they're, 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 can someone do the maths on that just quickly, please, just to, just to see what the... What the what the swing was. It's not the same numbers, though. There's more than 30 difference in the, in the data set for N. Oh, my goodness. It'll be a crude calculation, OK? Just to, <laughs> which it doesn't have to be to four decimal points. Let's, let's just, if someone, Nick, I'm looking at you. Can, can you please get the calculator going and just work that out? Just, and I do want to leave some time uh, for comments because I, I do think this is critical for the profession and for the AMA. And so please get ready for your comments. Just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. The first and, and perhaps most obvious is that our speakers spoke most passionately at times, um, and I'm sure at times they did passionately agree with what they were saying, but obviously at times they necessarily didn't as well. They were doing it to persuade you. Um, and I'm sure you'd agree with me that they all did a very fine job. And so I'd like you to thank, please, all six speakers once again. <laughs> So 
So we, th there are a number of themes here, and uh, as we all know, as I said, there's a national medical workforce strategy which clearly is going to need to be nuanced and very carefully thought out. There's a there's a need for workforce data, which we've recognised for a long time. Uh, some of the other themes with that we need to be better as a profession at helping medical students and, and junior doctors may make vocational training decisions, and clearly the AMA has a role there. Flexibility and improved training uh, opportunities uh, are important. Embracing technology changes, etc., uh, are important. And of course, of course, uh, dealing with the maldistribution problem. Um, so I just wanted to ask if there's any comments that people wanted to make uh, or queries or concerns uh, that they might want to just stay to the room or to direct to uh, any of the panel members. Was there any comments? Do you pop up to a microphone, please? Yes, please, microphone two, go ahead. Hi, Penny Brown. Look, I just had two comments. One is about flexibility of training between training programs. We see doctors in training go down a long way down a training program and one of the things I think that's really significant is how difficult it is for any of the trainees to swap and I think that actually impacts what happens at the other end. And the second comment I think is we've talked about numbers of students, we've talked about numbers of doctors in training but we also need to think about the impact of people coming out of training with no positions. So there are two comments. Uh, thank you. We'll take one more from Microphone two, and then we'll uh, Mark over. Kangaroo, radiologist from uh, Western Australia. I've been uh, in the workforce getting on to 50 years, so I've seen a lot of medical students come and go both in the UK, USA, and in Australia. And there's no question at this point in time that by the time our, grad uh, our medical students have finished their course and they hit the deck, their training is not to the standard which it was a decade ago, and certainly not to the standard which is required. And part of that is that training has, the numbers have increased, but the trainers have not been increased, and the ability for the trainer to provide the same sort of supervision, same sort of exposure, same sort of discussion just doesn't occur purely because of the volume. Thanks, Mark. Dr. Hodge from Brisbane. Uh, Chris, Rob Hodge. Um, just, uh, I wanted to put a historical perspective. The last time that Australia had an oversupply of doctors such as it has now was in the 19, early 1950s, and this was produced by the, the, the medical graduates coming out. These were post-Second post War, uh, World War, so if you matriculated in, um, and uh, if you were a returned serviceman, the Commonwealth paid for your medical school training. So we actually had a, a great oversupply of medical practitioners in the early 1950s. Because there was no Medicare, then there was no problem with rural and remote uh, practitioners. So every small town in Australia virtually had a medical practitioner because they couldn't, there was no Medicare, they couldn't sit at, on the, in a bulk building clinic at, in, uh, at Broadbeach and earn an income. Um, if we fast forward then to uh, that, that oversupply actually took till 1967 to actually dissipate. Uh, in, uh, when Medicare was introduced in February 84, uh, the, uh, and Neil Blewett, who was the health minister at that time, uh, introduced this system so that uh, ad uh, overseas medical practitioners were advantaged and therefore we had a a huge influx of overseas medical practitioners into Australia to, uh, so that the doctors in Australia wouldn't bill their patients. Remember, they, the, the Labor government at that time, which the Hawke-Keating government, wanted uh, the, as many people as possible to be bulk billed. <clears throat> Fast forward again to 1996 with the Howard government, and the, the health minister at that time was Michael Waldridge, and Michael Waldridge made it very plain that he wanted doctors to actually gap. So he wanted the people, the doctors to charge and he wanted to reduce the amount of bulk billing. Uh, and that's why he introduced the uh, restrictions on provider numbers, et cetera, that were so uh, despised by the, by the junior doctors at that time. In a, the, uh, he uh, introduced the uh, AMWAC, the Australian Medical For uh, Workforce Advisory Committee, uh, and that was uh, chaired by Professor David Thiel, who was the 
previous president of the RACS. Um, the AMA lobbied successfully the Prime Minister, that was uh, John Howard, to against the wishes of, of Michael Woolridge in the year 2000 to abolish AMWAC, and that's why the universities were allowed to loosen up and produce the and and produce this current um, tsunami of medical students. And for those of you, oh, look, I understand. I thought it was a brilliant debate. I thought a lot of you, the speakers, were great today. But the real problems are that I'm a tonsil doctor, and that 20 years ago I would have had 20 applicants, really good applicants, for let's say 16 registrar positions Australia-wide. In this most recent thing, we've had 70 really fantastic applicants for 16 positions, and that's really the problem. That uh, we have the, the students that are being produced are of wonderful quality. The young doctors are of great quality. They know so much, but we don't have the positions for them, and that's really a problem. And I'm very pleased that the AMA is now, if you like, going ahead and saying we wish to have a position now where we do have some restriction or, or at least advice that the government will listen to about medical student supply. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks for that. When, we're not going to get through all the comments, but we've got time for a few more. I promise I'll come back. But one more from Dr. Mac microphone one, Dr. Sean Rudd. Uh, Dr. Sean Rudd, general practitioner from Northern Ireland. Um, I think well, <laughs> it, was, it was very important for me, and, and I felt very privileged to, to get to medical school, and I felt very privileged to become a doctor. But I soon realised there was an oversupply of doctors in Northern Ireland. So don't be frightened of that. Do what I did in 1987. I came to a third world country and I helped you out. <laughs> <laughs> Dr Tessa Kennedy. Thanks, Chris. Look, I, I find it difficult going through um, the arguments of the debate. I think we get a bit tangled up putting together these two issues of um, over undersupply medical students and also the problems of whether our vocational training pathway is, or pathways are fit for purpose. To me, they're two quite distinct issues. In some way, I think the over undersupply of grads is almost a bit of a moot point, as surely the best measure of whether that is the case or is not the case is whether you end up with the doctors in the right places, in the right specialties, meeting community healthcare needs. And there's a big lag between med school and that happening. And so I think we, you know, looking at our grad numbers and we have a long kind of lag period where a whole lot of things can happen, including all these, you know, overlays of whether people work full time, part time, etc., cetera, um, to sort of determine numbers in at the beginning of training pipeline to numbers needed to come out. To me, the much more interesting and compelling or, or, or pressing problem to really be addressing is that one of whether the training programs that we have are fit for purpose. We've got clear geographic maldistribution and we've got clear specialty maldistribution with loads of aspiring surgeons, ENT or otherwise, and we've got complete um, you know, lack of people wanting to go into GP and, and psychiatry and other underserved specialties where there's immense community need. There's no pre-vocational experience in these community settings, which is probably a huge um, a lost opportunity. And we've got all these people going funneled into unaccredited limbo land, creating huge problems for trainee wellbeing with no guarantees of progression in the specialty training space. And we need to, I think, um, consider how we match and direct the training that we're providing to community need a little better. Thanks, Tessa. We've only got time for, for one more, and uh, I'll take Simon. Um, Look, thanks very much. And uh, obviously, the whole situation is a little bit more nuanced than the uh, uh, debate headed. Um, I think we do have to recognise that doctors are expensive. Um, and uh, we also have the ability to create business uh, for ourselves in situations where there is oversupply. So it's actually really important that we get it right and we have to plan a long time ahead. Um, but I think that the elephant in the room, and it was alluded to, is we have to balance this against the number of doctors we're bringing in. If we're bringing in almost as many doctors as we're training, then surely this whole debate, and I know that this is being looked at by the AMA as, uh, as well as government, um, the balance between doctors we're training and doctors we're bringing in. If we're training a huge uh, tsunami of young doctors and we're bringing in equal numbers from overseas, well, we've got a problem. But if we change the numbers that we are bringing in, then maybe we don't. 
And these two th issues, I think, have to be looked at concurrently. And we also have to recognise that in many cases we're bringing in doctors from overseas, perhaps from countries that need them a lot more than we do. And, uh, and there is an ethical issue there. So I, I think in terms of workforce, all these things have to be balanced up and we need to get it right because the consequences of not doing so is either doctors who are underutilised or a population who can't get the services they need. Thanks, Simon. The, so the results of the debate are up there and whether you want to call it on percentage swing or absolute vote, you can make up your mind as to who's won, but clearly there's been a little bit of a shift there. Um, I'd just uh, like you, please, while I'm giving out these uh, small tokens to our speakers, to give them one more round of applause for their great job this morning. <laughs> Tony? I'll just ask uh, Professor Newhouse to wait up here. Susan, we need you. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to invite the President to the stage. Um, Associate Professor Susan Newhouse um, was admitted as a fellow of the AMA yesterday, but it regrettably couldn't be here for that event. Uh, so we'll take advantage of her participation today. Tony. Thank you, Bev. On Friday, we inducted seven new members into the AMA role of fellows in recognition of their outstanding contribution to the medical profession and to the AMA for their demonstrated excellence in their medical specialty and in their role as medical advocates for the profession. Susan couldn't be with us, so it's only fitting that we acknowledge Associate Professor Susan Newhouse this morning. She's a long-standing AMA member She's a respected surgeon specialising in the management of melanoma and sarcoma. She's a distinguished army officer, an experienced board director and chair. She was elected to the AMA Federal Council in 2014 and in 2016 became chair of its Health, Finance and Economics Committee. And she's a co-patron of the RSL Virtual War Memorial. Her citation was read out in full on Friday but I would like you to join me in recognising the exemplary service and awarding her the fellowship to the AMA. Thank you. Thanks for that brief indulgence. Okay, well now for one of the highlights of AMA National Conference, the AMSA Address. And I'll invite uh, Miss Jessica Yang to make her way forward. It takes a while, Jessica, keep walking. Uh, we've got a few obstacles in your, in your way. So uh, Miss uh, Jessica Yang is the 2019 president of the Australian Medical Students Association, AMSA, the peak representative body for Australia's 17,000 medical students. AMSA connects, informs and represents students studying for, at each of Australia's 22 medical schools by means of advocacy campaigns, national events, community and wellbeing projects and publications. AMSA is a volunteer run organisation with a team of over 500 medical students overseen by a national executive and a board of directors, so that's AMSA. Uh, Jessica has completed her fourth year of medicine at Western Sydney Uni and a research project under Dr Ian Turner identifying alcohol knowledge and consumption in her local area. 
Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. I am thankful, thankful for the AMA for the opportunity to speak here today and for their ongoing support of AMSA, which is helping to shape the next generation of doctors. I am thankful for the privilege to study medicine and to be representing 17,000 of Australia's future doctors. My name is Jessica and I'm studying at the Western Sydney University School of Medicine. This year, I am the president of the Australian Medical Students Association. I am thankful for my identity and for my upbringing. I come from a diverse background. I was born in a helicopter flying from a rural island off the coast of Hong Kong, so my parents insist that I was born to soar great heights. My parents are from China, but they grew up in Japan. When I was 10 months old, my family moved back to Australia, where I now live in Western Sydney. Mine is a dynamic cultural experience that many Aussies can relate to and are proud of. Maybe not the helicopter bit. But the bridge between my ethnicity and my nationality was one that I struggled with. When seeking support for my presidential bid, I had specifically been told that my age, my gender, and most pertinently, my race would make me an unattractive candidate. You don't sound Asian, a stakeholder told me, so you've got that going for you. When elected at AMSA's second council last year, I was informed that I was the first non-white president of AMSA. My first reaction was one of disbelief. I'm surrounded every day by my colleagues from all backgrounds, and when you consider the diverse makeup of the medical workforce, whom society looks to as leaders, how can our leadership not reflect this? A friend of mine who is of Indian background told me, you should be proud. Because of your visibility, more people who may not fit the traditional mold of a leader will be encouraged to put their hat into the ring. I responded to this with indignation and fear. Why was it now up to me to lead a crusade of diversity within medical student leadership? As you've probably gathered, these two reactions are incongruent. I was simultaneously complaining about the current state of representation, but wary to take ownership of a chance to make change. I thought back to an interaction in 2016 that I had with the now AMA New South Wales president, Dr. Ken Seng Lim. 
He told me, there needs to be more people like you at the table. Make sure you stick around. Remembering this, I realized it is not about me, but it is about the 17,000 peers who have given me the privilege to speak on their behalf. Many people in this room have the same privilege to represent their peers, and I implore you to use this opportunity. Use this experience to look out for those who do not have the same opportunities to speak up or to create change. Use your seat at the table, use your visibility to lift others up so they can be visible too. It would be remiss of me not to mention Dr. Yumiko Kadoda when discussing non-conventional leadership. She published her personal story on her blog, The Ugly Side of Becoming a Surgeon, where her experiences as an unaccredited registrar working 180 hours on call shocked the general public. Unfortunately, for many of, of you in this room and for those around me at medical school, this story of burnout and a lack of systemic support is not one that shocks us. It is all too familiar. I recall my own experience as a student last year, which required a reasonable 35 hours a week of clinical contact. Then add 20 hours of study, 20 hours of part-time work weekend on weekends to pay my rent, and a two-hour daily commute. Any remaining time was spent simply surviving. This does not hold a candle to Dr. Kadoda's experience, but it does make me worry for what our future holds. I went to the only local GP available after hours. I was convinced that I had developed narcolepsy because I frequently found myself falling asleep throughout the day, most worryingly, behind the wheel. Perhaps I did have a temporary bout of stress-induced narcolepsy, or perhaps I just didn't want to admit that I was burning out. If this is the environment in which we start our journey and form our habits into medicine, what happens when we have the responsibility of patient safety on our shoulders? We work harder, we work longer, and we become tired. We will make mistakes. Considering these experiences makes me think more broadly of the current state of medical education and training. HDs and exams, getting multiple degrees, CV buffing, these things certainly require talent and they look great on paper, but are we becoming better doctors in the process? Nobel Prize winning economist Michael Spence observed the phenomenon where people pursued academic achievements to signal their worth rather than to improve their skills. Medical students are watching and we're worried. We see our mentors who are vastly more qualified than us fighting unprecedented competition for specialty training. We watch our recently graduated colleagues who are pursuing a PhD for no other reason than to improve their chances. We hear stories of extracurricular courses and pre-training exams which contribute to a very expensive curriculum vitae just to keep up with shifting college goalposts. We think to ourselves, how am I ever going to get there? Know that we are watching and we are listening to you and we see that you are under pressure. This pressure is filtering down into medical school. I was recently at an orientation week and a group of about half a dozen first years approached the AMSA store. They were asking about how to get involved. Great, I thought. I asked them, why are you interested in joining AMSA? Honestly, Jess, because extracurriculars look good on a CV. This was their third day of being a medical student. For some of them, it was their third day at university. These students have not even stepped foot in a hospital and they're already thinking about how to do, outdo their peers in 10 years' time. At last year's AMA National Conference, a motion was passed to credit postgraduate clinical experience more heavily in specialty training, sorry, specialty college applications rather than the current focus on academia. I applaud this preventative step in addressing an increasingly competitive climate. It reinforces the idea that we should be working with each other for our patients and their safety, instead of adding lines to our CV which do not drive our passions or improve our clinical ability. Recently, I spoke at an event before a plenary by an incredibly impressive and well-regarded doctor. As happens with many conferences, my talk was pushed back and subsequently so was his. He expressed his annoyance by telling the audience that I should not have spoken before him 
and then telling the event staff that I was a naughty girl and what I had to say was irrelevant. I was humiliated. I felt belittled in my capacity as a leader and belittled because of my gender. This is the type of insidious behavior that is perpetuating a toxic undercurrent in medicine. Many of us shrug it off, but I'm asking you to call it out like my peers did for me at the time. While I am uncomfortable recounting this, as someone in a position of power, I have a duty to do so, and so do you. We should empower those who are belittled and disregarded as unimportant, because that is how to best drive change. When we express dissatisfaction with the status quo, medical students are often told it is your generation that will lead the change, just hang on until the old ones leave. Please stop telling us this. This idea of generational change only serves to isolate you from us, and we should be working together now more than ever. We cannot wait for change that may never come. We cannot change if we continue to advance into a system that disengages us and makes us cynical. This conversation is not new to anyone in this room. We've heard these calls to action over the weekend and even over the years from my predecessors. I would urge you to reflect on your time in medicine. What made your life better and what challenged you? What was the worst thing that happened to you as a student or a junior doctor and how can you stop it from happening to someone else? The medical profession can do amazing things when we stand together for a common cause. Last month, AMSA was accepted as a stakeholder at the United Nations high-level meeting on universal healthcare. This incredible opportunity for international advocacy was only made possible by the tireless work done by hundreds of medical students who volunteer their time for AMSA and for our community as a whole. They juggle medical school and those demanding roles to improve the system for those who come after us. The video played at the start of my address showcased the ability of passionate medical students to make change. In January, AMSA supported pill testing trials and improvements to harm minimization techniques. In February, AMSA implored parliamentary support for the Medivac bill. In March, AMSA rallied to demand action on climate change and its effects on health. On each of these issues, we stood beside the AMA, and together, our voices were collectively amplified. These are the issues that your future members want to see you fighting for and need your support on. And I'm very thankful for Dr. Tony Bartoni for being so supportive in our advocacy efforts and for actively welcoming me to the leadership table. I've touched on a lot of different issues today, which all come back to a fundamental need to change the status quo. These issues may seem insurmountable when heard back to back in 15 minutes, but I ask you to consider the old adage, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It does take hard work to lift up your juniors, your medical students and those without a voice and to take them along with you on the ride. But it only starts with small acts of kindness. Tell people to stick around, call out unacceptable behavior and take care of each other. I would like to end by helping you visualize what exactly is possible when a group of people lift each other up and take care of each other. Thank you. Ask Jessica to, to stay on the on the uh, podium so we can all see her for another couple of minutes. Thank you, Jessica. On behalf of all of us, every year I say that the AMSA addresses the highlight of national conference, and again this year, uh, we take on board your comments. Uh, for many years, I have heard people describe the medical students as next generation's leaders. But I have yet to find a generation that was ever led by one set of leaders. Uh, the leaders I know of uh, have led many generations. 
So you are not next generation's leaders, you are leaders and you are a leader. Congratulations. On behalf of all of us, congratulations on your achievements in office and on a splendid address today. Thank you. All right, that completes this morning's programs. Uh, could you please register for the soapbox, um, anybody who has something to say, with Cindy, who's at the uh, desk at the left here. Um, and we'll see you back here at 11 uh, for that session. Thank you. <laughs>